lecture, I uh, um, started discussing what are the ways of imaging different types of topological defects and topological and non-trivial three-dimensional director field configurations in liquid crystals. And uh, we discussed the conventional polarizing optical microscopy as well as different three-dimensional optical imaging techniques. And uh, this is a slide we um, discussed last, right? Um, and uh, um, what I want to continue with is that is to show you that not only we can use nonlinear processes such as uh, um, three photon absorption based um, fluorescence, but also uh, Raman scattering based approaches to do three dimensional imaging of director structures in the crystal. And so we all know that Raman scattering has this unique feature that it can provide chemically specific information. You can have based on it, information about all chemical bonds present in your materials. Uh, and it's just like infrared spectroscopy provides us um, information about those different chemical bonds you have. Um, uh, the uh, unfortunate part is, however, that uh, we typically deal with very tiny optical signals, right? So um, typical Raman scattering uh, the antistocks and stocks Raman scattering is on the 10 to power minus 10 um, uh, in terms of intensity of that of excitation light. <coughs> so we either would have to use fairly strong excitation beams, or otherwise uh, we would be dealing with inherently very weak signals. Um, and uh, we cannot use very high laser powers for excitations because this can damage samples, um, those are soft matter samples, as we recall. Uh, on the other hand, if we have very weak signals, we cannot do three-dimensional imaging because the signal integration times would have to be long, so, uh, you know, it would take days to collect three-dimensional images. Uh, so conventional Raman scattering cannot provide this capability for us, right? Although we can take uh, Raman spectra of liquid crystals such as those based on 5CB or 8CB, very similar type of molecule we discussed last time with a little bit longer hydrocarbon chain which can form both smectic and pneumatic liquid crystal phases. And so we can see those uh, different spectral lines corresponding to chemi different chemical bonds. For example, this line here corresponds to the uh, CM chemical bond here. And even if uh, for conventional Raman scattering uh, in an aligned liquid crystal sample, we take Raman spectra for two orthogonal polarizations, one parallel to the liquid crystal director, one orthogonal to liquid crystal director, we can see polarization dependence, right? You can see the difference between the black and the red spectral lines. But as I already mentioned, the signals are inherently very weak, so we cannot easily use uh, conventional Raman scattering for uh, three-dimensional imaging purposes. Otherwise, it's a very long process to collect those two-dimensional images, um, <clears throat> and we don't have inherent three-dimensional resolution. Um, so uh, instead, we therefore will use uh, not spontaneous Raman scattering, um, but uh, stimulated Raman scattering process, uh, and we will use two different stimulated Raman scattering techniques. The first one of them is uh, coherent atmosphere Raman scattering, or CARS for short, um, and uh, this approach allows us to obtain million times or so stronger signals, right, which are still Raman signals with all the information about all chemical bonds uh, that could be of interest for us. Um, and so the way to do it is to use uh, femtosecond <coughs> um, pulse laser sources as two different frequencies, and here we have omega pump and omega stops to laser frequencies selected in such a way that 
the difference of those two frequencies or beating frequencies is matched to the intrinsic frequency of the chemical bond of interest right and so as we do it we can then detect anti stops Raman scattering um, which will provide us information about those different chemical bonds that we prop uh, this way right and so uh, so here you can see that this is a three quarter third order nonlinear process right in order to obtain this uh, um, uh, anti stops Raman scattering in here in the visible part of spectrum we typically use uh, uh, two laser frequencies of excitation lines, right? But three photons are involved in uh, two photons at pump probe frequency uh, and one at stops frequency. And as we drive this, drive this stimulated trauma scattering process, we then obtain uh, anti stops trauma scattering at the frequency equal to omega p minus omega s, right? Because we selected this frequency difference, uh, difference between omega pump and omega stocks to be equal to that of intrinsic vibration frequency of the chemical bond of interest. Now, not only um, we can do it by uh, then tuning those um, frequencies of uh, excitation uh, to select different chemical bonds of interest, uh, but we can also use broadband uh, stocks excitation so that we can obtain information about um, different chemical bonds at the same time. And so this provides us not only information about the presence of this, those different chemical bonds of interest in different locations in the sample, but also their orientations because we use uh, polarized excitation light, right, both uh, uh, stops and pump probe laser excitation beams are polarized linearly um, and so as we now can see from the graph in here um, the uh, two different car signals obtained for polarizations parallel and per per perpendicular to the liquid crystal director uh, for the spectral line in here corresponding to the CN chemical bond of 8CB liquid crystal molecule are uh, uh, quite a bit different, right? So the solid lines you can see. Um, and uh, this orientational sensitivity again will allow us to probe patterns of molecular alignment in liquid crystals. Um, and so uh, you can note in the very same graph, we also pro uh, plotted conventional Raman scattering signals corresponding to this uh, um, spectral line of CN chemical bond. And uh, um, so the, the difference uh, in, the, um, in the two uh, coordinate axes that we used to plot those is 100,000 times, and despite of that difference, you still can see that um, the car signals uh, are larger even on those different scales, right? So, uh, so, so the integration time for car signal is 100,000 times shorter, uh, but we still can see larger signal compared to conventional Raman scattering. So the enhancement is of the order of million times as uh, already mentioned to you before. So uh, CARS is third order nonlinear process, uh, but uh, we can also use second order version of stimulated Raman scattering, which is called just SRS, stimulated Raman scattering, um, uh, and uh, we can do it in the polarizing microscopy mode as well. Um, so, uh, in here again, in terms of excitation, there is no difference. We use pump and stocks laser frequencies for excitation. Again, we tune them uh, in such a way that the frequency difference is corresponding to the chemical bond of interest. But um, um, now we also modulate the stocks laser beam, right, in such a way that um, uh, uh, 
as you can see here, while pump beam is not modulated. Um, and so then uh, those two beams are co-located in space and time and focused uh, into a tiny subtraction limited spot in the sample, which then is scanned in three dimensions. Um, and then what we probe is uh, the um, pump beam in um, transmission mode. Uh, so whenever uh, we have some chemical bonds present for which we tuned the frequency difference to match those chemical bonds, um, then uh, we have stimulated Raman laws, right, which we can detect because we have this modulation uh, of the Stokes laser beam, uh, and uh, we can detect tiny um, <coughs> oscillations in uh, the pump laser beam detected in this forward detection mode here using lock and amplifier, right, at that frequency uh, of difference, uh, uh, the frequency of uh, uh, modulation in here. And so uh, this allows us to do, again, um, uh, SRS, microscopy, visualize three-dimensional patterns of molecular alignment uh, in liquid crystals. Um, so uh, uh, not only we can do those different types of nonlinear optical imaging with different liquid crystal samples, as you could see, uh, label-free imaging, right, because we utilize either intrinsic fluorescence of liquid crystal molecules, like in the case of 3 photon excitation uh, polarizing uh, fluorescence microscopy, um, or chemical bonds provided us uh, the Raman scattering, stimulated Raman scattering signals. Uh, but we can do all of those different nonlinear optical imaging modalities at the same time. Right? So, uh, in here you can see vertical cross sections of liquid crystal cells, right, where, um, you know, this conventional polarizing microscopy, as you understand, you wouldn't be able to take a side view of the sample you are interested in, because that wouldn't provide three-dimensional resolution. Um, in here, we can take a liquid crystal cell and obtain a cross-section of direct structure of such a liquid crystal cell. In here, this is done for cholesteric liquid crystal. And we can do with a couple different um, imaging modalities at the same time. So we can do two photon uh, absorption-based fluorescence microscopy, three photon absorption-based fluorescence microscopy, and cars microscopy uh, by simply using the very same excitation laser beams, right, and then detecting uh, the uh, fluorescence or uh, run scheduling signals in different parts of the spectrum, just simply using different interference filters for selection of signals of interest, right? So what this means is um, we can use those techniques at the very same time, in the very sam same sample, and uh, compare uh, the reconstructed director fields that we obtain based on um, uh, use of those techniques. So, um, now that we discussed different types of imaging, I would like to ask a clicker question. Um, and let's see. Um, what answers we get? So, again, you have an opportunity to visit uh, uh, Femtosecond Laser Lab in here at this university. Uh, so, interesting that. Uh, The question is related in here.
Alright, so I'll stop the system just because there is a lot of material we have to go through. Probably not everybody got their clickers ready and bolted, but let's see what we got. Um, and so Okay, so this is the distribution majority answer D, and uh, indeed I hope I was able to demonstrate that um, all of the things are becoming possible because of the nonlinear nature of uh, optical imaging techniques that we were using, uh, and uh, indeed this wouldn't be possible without uh, the pulsed lasers and femtosecond pulsed lasers in our case. Um, finally, I would like to um, discuss with you very briefly uh, two manipulation techniques, which would in include optical laser manipulation and then also magnetic tweezers, right, that we can use to control topological defects in director structures. And uh, a little bit later in this course, um, Halina Rubinstein Dunlop will um, probably give much more deep overview of uh, uh, optical tweezers and uh, how this technique works as well as we'll discuss with you uh, different types of applications um, but um, this is very brief overview and then we'll see uh, an example of application to the case of liquid crystal defects um, so uh, um, as I'm sure many of you no, laser tweezers allow us to grab tiny objects such as uh, colloidal microparticles uh, with tightly focused laser beams and move them around, measure uh, uh, colloidal interaction forces and so on. So it's a very powerful tool um, and uh, um, uh, it's very useful in liquid crystal research as well. So, uh, uh, the uh, um, <clears throat> reason we can use this tool uh, is because we have different types of uh, optical forces at work in here. And uh, uh, the first force uh, is the so-called scattering force, which we can understand because of the presence of refractive index contrast uh, between the colloidal inclusions or other objects could be for example bacteria or um, biological cells um, and the surrounding medium right so because of that refractive this difference we have some of the photons backscattered and um, um, due to the refractive this difference and this scattering force is simply proportional to intensity of the used laser light or E squared. Um, then, uh, in addition to this, when we have tightly focused laser beams, because, um, um, say, using high numerical <laughs> objectives, uh, we can also have pretty strong uh, optical gradient forces, which are proportional to the gradient of laser light intensity, or gradient E squared in here. Um, and they are also dependent highly on the refractive indices of uh, the object we are manipulating and the surrounding medium. Typically, in order to have uh, stable manipulation, we would need uh, to have refractive index of this object to be higher than that of surrounding medium. Um, and uh, um, uh, the gradient force to be larger than the scattering force uh, so that um, this gradient force can pull the uh, object to the time to the focus of the focal point of the tightly focused laser beam and then um, if we can move the laser beam uh, the focal point of the laser beam uh, within the sample we can also manipulate this uh, object, right? So, uh, uh, the nature of the optical gradient force is um, essentially uh, the dielectrophoretic force at optical frequency, right? So, because um, uh, in here we have 
a strong gradient of electric field at optical frequency. And so uh, uh, we can see also that uh, when we try to focus laser beam, we have a strong gradient of intensity. So this force therefore pulls the particles with refractive index higher than that of surrounding medium to the center of the focused laser beam and then we can manipulate those objects by manipulating the focal point of the laser beam. And so um, it's easy to estimate what uh, are the forces involved in the optical manipulation. Uh, we can do it simply using dimensional analysis uh, that would be uh, power of the laser beam divided on, by the speed of light. And from this very simple estimate, we can see that we can obtain forces on the order of um, piconewton per milliwatt of laser power. Um, and so although those forces likely look very tiny to you, but um, you can appreciate that they are strong enough to manipulate micro-sized objects um, by simply comparing to the forces of gravity which would be acting, say, on a polymer um, microparticles in a fluid suspension. And those are uh, still three orders or so uh, of magnitude smaller than uh, those optical forces that we can use for laser manipulation. Now, the next technique I want to introduce is magnetic holonomic control that um, will allow us to not only control um, <clears throat> the translational degrees of freedom of objects such as colloidal particles, but also rotational degrees of freedom. Right? So, uh, by using um, the, uh, colloidal particles such as superparamagnetic particles in which we can uh, induce magnetic dipoles by applying magnetic field and then using different um, magnetic solenoids aligned, as you can see depicted in here, along the Cartesian coordinate axis. Um, in combination with laser tweezers, uh, we can control all degrees of freedom of uh, micron-sized objects such as colloidal particles because with laser tweezers we can move them, change uh, x, y, z coordinates, um, you know, at will um, by um, steering the laser beam while by applying magnetic fields to those uh, coils in here we can rotate uh, the superparamagnetic particles around all Euler angles, right? So um, this means um, we have uh, all needed control over such uh, colloidal inclusions, superparamagnetic particles in liquid crystal. So now let us see how combination of those laser manipulation techniques can be applied to control topological defects um, I'm thinking it would be probably helpful to turn off some lights um, to see the movie better, but you probably still can see uh, how we are generating uh, fairly complicated three-dimensional uh, coiled structure of topological defect line in the liquid crystal by simply uh, rotating and translating uh, the cluster of such superparamagnetic particles inside of liquid crystal medium. Um, and so this can be done in combination with three-dimensional optical imaging using one of those nonlinear optical imaging techniques that we discussed, right? So you, you can see those uh, interesting structures of kinks um, in the defect configurations that we manipulated. Um, and so uh, we can um, do three-dimensional optical imaging to reconstruct director field configuration nearby one of those uh, kinks in the defect line, right? And so looking at this structure and remembering what Robin told us uh, yesterday, you probably are wondering how is it possible that the defect line is terminating on the colloidal particle in here, right? We know that uh, 
for topologically stable defect lines, it should not be possible, right? So there is some mystery in here, and um, uh, we can indeed uh, uncover this mystery by doing three-dimensional imaging using this nonlinear outcome microscopy. So in here we can take slices at three different depth levels. I mean, it's um, slicing of the sample uh, that you can do at will, but I just showed three different planes at different depth levels, right? And so you can see how structure of the defect line changes as you go um, along the z-axis perpendicular to the screen in here. Then we can also slice the sample along those red lines you see here. Um, <clears throat> uh, so again, to uncover the structure of this kink, uh, that we work with, and you can already see that this is cholesterol structure that we are dealing with. Uh, those um, uh, brighter and darker uh, stripes that you can see correspond to uh, the cholesterol intrinsic periodicity, and then we have um, uh, in here um, a structure uh, that we can further understand by obtaining even more slices in here along the defect line for two orthogonal polarizations um, and based on those images we can then reconstruct what is the complicated three-dimensional defect configuration that we are dealing with uh, so uh, what we have in here is a quadruple of disclinations uh, defect lines, right? and because it's a quadruple this means we have um, two minus one over two disclinations and two plus one over two disclinations. So overall, it's neutral, right? And therefore, we can have it uh, terminating on a colloidal particle, right? Um, uh, so it's just because uh, the net strength of the defect cluster that we are dealing with is zero, um, and uh, uh, so you can see. Uh, how this structure remains non-singular uh, the lambda discriminations are non-singular defect lines as we'll discuss in just a little bit um, and uh, the structure overall remains non-singular as um, it uh, uh, undergoes this kink in this location uh, where discriminations are following the helical structure of cholesterol defect what is yeah. the anchoring condition on the polyp particle? Uh, the tangential one in this case. Alright, so there is a clicker question for students, which is um, related to the laser manipulation. So we discussed lots of different imaging and manipulation techniques. The question here is uh, related to laser tweezers, laser traps, what is it that we need? What of those components are essential? Or maybe not. So I'll stop the system. Uh, and still a small fraction of people voted. Don't be shy. Even if you're not sure about answer, it's okay to vote. Okay, so let me stop. Uh, uh, right, so uh, Quite a distribution. I felt you are maybe not sure. Uh, so the only essential component is high numerical aperture objectives because um, uh, you remember that we use CW laser source for optical manipulation. It's for imaging that we need pulsed um, femtosecond laser lines. But for manipulation, it's okay to use uh, uh, continuous wave laser source. 
Okay, so essentially this was what I originally was planning to cover during the first lecture, um, but um, uh, of course it took more time than I expected. Um, so now I would like to proceed with um, showing particular examples of how uh, the combination of different manipulation techniques and imaging techniques can be used to uh, control and visualize three-dimensional director field configurations and videos in the crystals. And so the first example is related to different types of switching on liquid crystals. So we know that uh, in all the different types of liquid crystal displays, we typically apply fairly low voltages to switch them on the order of just one volt or so. Um, and uh, uh, this Poisson response of liquid crystals to the different types of fields, including electric field in this case, um, allows us to change optical properties and use liquid crystals in different types of applications. Um, so, uh, uh, in the case of electric field, uh, this occurs to minimize the electric field term of free energy where we have coupling between electric field and director field um, and uh, um, this coupling will depend on uh, many different things like for example the electric anisotropy and so on but um, um, we will, what we will do next is we will see how we can also have coupling between the electric field at optical frequencies and the director but before we do that, I again would like to ask a clicker question, which is uh, just to see how familiar you are with uh, perhaps the most fundamental application of liquid crystals, um, which is um, um, the uh, so-called um, electric free phase transition that we use in display applications and many other applications. So the question is, the threshold voltage in a liquid crystal cell or display depends on which of those um, uh, parameters of cell or material parameters of liquid crystal. Okay, so please vote. Of course, I know that um, a large fraction of students <coughs> did not deal with liquid crystals before, so likely uh, this question uh, might be difficult for you, but uh, I just want to see if what a fraction of students is familiar with this material already. system uh, and so let's see uh, so majority answered it correctly indeed B and C uh, so the threshold voltage is dependent on the last constant and the electric anisotropy but is independent of cell sickness uh, and uh, rotational viscosity of liquid crystal also does not come into play because um, uh, we don't have dynamics of switching involved um, uh, in this case but um, uh, so what I would like to discuss next is how we can have um, a similar effect happening also at optical frequencies right? so when we look at the tightly focused laser beam we realize that we have um, uh, this intensity in here, pretty much the big C squared, right? So uh, we have pretty strong electric field at optical wave, and uh, um, therefore we can also have optical realignment of uh, the director field because of similar type of coupling. Uh, we remember that the uh, electric field of the optical wave is along the polarization of the laser beam. 
And so, for example, here we can have linearly polarized laser light incident uh, on the liquid crystal cell in this geometry. And due to similar type of coupling as in the liquid crystal uh, display at low frequencies, and here we can realign liquid crystal at um, the optical frequencies. Um, of course, provided that we have uh, high enough laser intensity, right, so it's also not going to happen at very low intensity, there will be some special intensity needed for this realignment, uh, just like we saw there is a threshold voltage that you need to apply in order to realign the crystal at low frequencies of electric field. Um, so now, however, if you would turn off the laser beam at some point in here, we would see the director realigning back to the uniform structure, right? Because we can imagine that um, such director distortions, uh, director field distortions, would cause some elastic energy, and to minimize this elastic energy, uh, uh, liquid crystal would go back to uniform state. Now, what I will demonstrate to you is that when we use chiral nematic or cholesteric liquid crystals, as you remember, those are composed from molecules that have those chiral centers or mixtures of molecules with chiral centers and the ones without such chiral centers. Um, so when those chiral nematic liquid crystals are confined between substrates with perpendicular surface boundary conditions, so that the intrinsic helical structure of the cholesteric liquid crystal is incompatible with those boundary conditions and we have frustration, right, because uh, uh, the boundary conditions tend to unwind the liquid crystal director field. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, initially we can fully unwind the liquid crystal director, but what I will discuss with you is what happens if we now a shine laser beam of light into such a liquid crystal cell. And uh, we will not use just plain Gaussian laser beam, but Laguerre Gaussian beam um, uh, that uh, will be uh, focused into the liquid crystal sample. So I would like to remind you that Laguerre Gaussian beams uh, are nothing else but optical vortices. Um, so those beams have um, screw dislocations in the face of light or optical vortices um, uh, <coughs> of the laser beam. Um, and uh, those optical vortices can be characterized by topological charge, just like defects in liquid crystals are. Um, and uh, uh, so, um, now, uh, depending on the value of the um, topological charge, um, uh, we can then look at different intensity profiles corresponding to those laser beams. Right, so when uh, L is zero, we just have Gaussian beam, and you're quite familiar with it, I'm sure. But uh, uh, when uh, L is not zero, um, uh, then we can have those donut-shaped Laguerre Gaussian beams, um, and the intensity here is plotted uh, in the focal plane of focused laser beam when uh, 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 in the plane perpendicular to the beam axis and uh, the XZ plane is parallel to the laser beam axis, right? And so you can see as you increase the charge of Laguerre Gaussian beam, uh, the size of that donut of high intensity uh, is increasing. Um, and so as you are now shining this Laguerre Gaussian beam or optical vortex to liquid crystal sample confined between substrates with perpendicular surface boundary conditions, um, once you shine you can generate a structure uh, that you can see viewed in here between cross polarizer and analyzer. Um, and uh, um, what's interesting is that you can then turn off the laser beam, but the structure does not disappear. It's stable uh, uh, after this generation, even after you turn off the laser light. 
Uh, we don't need high laser powers to generate those structures, only on the order of tens of milliwatts, uh, and the, need, the beam needs to be shined for tens of milliseconds. Um, now, we can do three dimensional imaging to reconstruct the director field configuration corresponding to such uh, configuration in here, right, um, and see what is it that we have. Um, and so, in this particular case, it turns out that what we have is uh, a double twist cylinder looped on itself, or double twist torus of director field. And this internal structure that you see in here is, as you already recognize, probably nothing else but uh, the part of Hopf vibration we discussed yesterday, uh, yesterday during my introductory lecture that uh, I was using to motivate why is it that we need those three-dimensional imaging techniques to study topological defects and structures in the crystals. But then, in addition well, to this double twist torus, uh, we also can see two point defects uh, at the top and the bottom. And uh, overall, the structure can be embedded in the uh, homotropic or liquid crystal cell with perpendicular boundary conditions and uniform unbound directional field. Now, uh, um, if you would now decorate the director field lines by... What is the size? Um, the size can be controlled, um, so depending on the cell thickness and the intrinsic pitch uh, of cholesteric that you are using can be anywhere from hundreds of nanometers to hundreds of microns and uh, we can uh, control the size, right? Because uh, the width is comparable to cholesteric pitch. Um, so the reason those structures are stable, as we will see in just a minute, is because they allow you to introduce cholesteric twist uh, in the frustrated cholesteric sample um, that is fully unwound, right? Uh, so this allows to minimize elastic free energy local, as we will see. Alright, so uh, now if we decorate the director field lines by uh, vector field, um, and um, so this is a cross-section of such a structure, and it has axial symmetry, right? Um, uh, then what we can see is that those two point defects have um, opposite um, signs, um, so they self-compensate each other, so this structure is uh, the structure that we call total, is homeomorphic or topological equivalent to the whole vibration structure. But um, as we could see from the example I already showed briefly yesterday, uh, we can also generate such a structure without the point defects, right? Just that, um, um, the whole vibration embedded in the crystal. Um, so, uh, 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 and uh, in here, those different colors, as we discussed, depict the molecular orientation pattern on the torah, one of the torah um, uh, of such a whole vibration. Okay, so now let us see what types of um, uh, different defect uh, configurations we can have uh, that are built on this double twist torus. Um, embedded in the uniform liquid crystal field. So, um, in addition to uh, the just the plain hot vibration, we can have uh, the structures with uh, um, two point defects of opposite charges, as we could see from the example I just showed, um, as well as uh, two ring defects, uh, where because the point defect is topologically equivalent to a defect loop, um, and uh, um, so even the point defects have internal structure um, um, that is uh, a tiny defect loop, but they can be also um, much larger defect loops of half integer discriminations, um, and uh, so the overall uh, the types of structures that we can observe is the ones 
where we have double twist torus uh, accompanied by uh, point defects, a point defect in the loop or two loop defects. And uh, by using optical vortices or topological uh, uh, laser beams with topological defects in the phase of light, we can control what exactly type of field configurations and defects we generate in a liquid crystal sample. So in here, uh, we will keep those uh, field configurations the same, but we'll just change one of them in here. Um, and so it corresponds to the double twist torus with two defect loops uh, of half integer discriminations. But then um, this was generated with uh, uh, optical vortex having a uh, charge L equal 9. However, as we switch this charge to L equal 5, we see one of the defect loops shrink into a point defect. Um, and uh, this is the change in appearance of such a structure uh, between cross polarizers. Um, as we would then switch the uh, uh, charge of Laguerre Gaussian beam to 3, uh, we see that both of the point, uh, different loops shrink to point defects, and so uh, we have a current configuration with two point defects accompanying the double twist torus. Um, so you might ask a question why are those field configurations stable uh, after you turn off the laser light? Right? Because when we initially, as I already mentioned, we have a liquid crystal cell with perpendicular surface boundary conditions uh, and the director field is fully unbound in such a liquid crystal cell. Right? But uh, we remember that the um, uh, frank ozian elastic free energy for a chiral nematic or cholesteric liquid crystal has this chiral term in here, which um, uh, this K to 2 term is uh, unhappy, it's not minimized uh, when we have fully unbound field configuration of this type, um, right? Because the chiral nature of the liquid crystal we use cannot be realized uh, in the form of twisted field configuration in this case, with intrinsic pitch. Uh, P in here. Um, however, when we generate such a torrent configuration, we realize that uh, we have now double twist torus or looped double twist cylinder here, so the twist is realized in the best possible way for uh, this type of uh, chiral liquid crystal material. Uh, and therefore, the twist term uh, in free energy as well as uh, um, the so-called K to 4 term of free energy would benefit from introducing such a structure, right? So, um, in a fully unwound liquid crystal cell, like the one depicted in here, um, the system is frustrated, right? Just because uh, the chiral nature of the material cannot be realized in a twisted configuration of liquid crystal, but we can relieve this frustration by focusing Laguerre Gaussian laser beam uh, locally and generating such a field configuration with a lot of twists. Now, we can note, however, that um, this twist can be realized only also by additionally introducing the band and splay distortions and topological defects, and so they cost some elastic energy in terms of band play parts of uh, terms of, of this free energy, um, as well as point defects would have, you know, some melted cores or biaxial cores, uh, and therefore cost additional energy. And so uh, um, the free energy of parts of the sample with such torrents and without them could be uh, comparable, right? Uh, but there is a very strong energy barrier to go from one state to the other state, and therefore uh, both untwisted structures uh, and the ones with such torrents can be present uh, at the same time. And we can control them by uh, laser beams of light and also by applying 
voltage um, or other types of fields, right? And so those different structures can be switched from one to the other. Um, um, okay, so uh, uh, what is important to realize uh, is that uh, uh, this field configuration is topologically protected, right? Because remember, when we have this double twist torus, uh, the director field lines, just like in the Hopf vibration we discussed, are linked with respect to each other. And you need to destroy this liquid crystal ordering in order to go back to the uniform unbound state or go from here to here. This is impossible to do without using laser beams of light or generating those structures otherwise by you know, perturbing this director field configuration. Um, and so the strong energetic barrier, is, which is on the order of thousands of K Boltzmann T, prevents this transition from happening uh, spontaneously. Of course, uh, the uh, barrier is dependent on the size of the system, so it's thousands of K Boltzmann T for micron sized. Um, you know, uh, torrent configurations, but if you go to 100 nanometer size, it becomes substantially smaller and it can be substantially larger if you go to bigger hundreds of micrometer sized uh, field configurations and so on. So now, uh, uh, this discussion, uh, yes? Are there time scales in which the, the thermal effects can undo this? The um, so when we have an uh, energetic barrier in the range of thousands of cables T, those uh, field configurations can be stable for years, and we see them in samples stable for many years, right? Uh, but um, if you would go down to ten tens of um, cables T then obviously thermal effects would have much stronger influence. But this would be possible to do only when you have small, you know, uh, uh, torrent structures. Um, so you would need short pitch cholesteric liquid crystals to be able to play with those, or maybe perhaps uh, heat the sample to be very close to pneumatic isotropic transition where, uh, you know, the uh, elastic constants would become a little bit smaller and uh, the barrier would be smaller because well. Uh, Alright, so um, this discussion that we had um, of the physical nature of stability of those field configurations um, can be also tested numerically, right? So here we just discussed very qualitatively, but we can actually minimize this elastic free energy, and this is something Paul can do quite easily um, by doing, using director relaxation method. Um, uh, and so uh, then one can plot the elastic free energy um, uh, uh, density either surfaces, uh, as you can see the picture from here for such a torrent field configuration. And so you can see that indeed the um, um, elastic free energy is minimized in the central part of torrents at pretty high, uh, close to uh, the topological point defects, uh, but um, overall free energy of uh, torrent per unit volume of liquid crystal can be comparable to that of fully unbound liquid crystal um, uh, or can be lower than that uh, depending on material parameters of the cell uh, and, and cell parameters that we choose. Now, what is important to realize is that we can generate those torn field configurations in many different ways. Uh, one way of generating them is at somewhat higher laser powers when we can pin the torrents to the particular locations in the liquid crystal cell of interest. And so this way we can generate, for example, CU, right, uh, from the topological field configurations, and those torrents do not move away. They just stay in the location 
where we generated them. Moreover, you can see that in here we used uh, different types of toilets, some with just point defects and some with point defects and loops um, to, to depict it. But we can also generate them in such a way that those torrents behave like quasi-particles. So they would undergo Brownian motions and they would interact with each other. And this makes them even more interesting, right? So in here you can see such uh, uh, localized field configurations of torrents interacting with each other repulsively. When we grab them with laser tweezers and move them close to each other, but then turn all the laser beam and watch how they repel from each other, um, away from each other, right? And so uh, then um, uh, we can uh, probe elastic interactions in self-assembly of such structures because if we generate many of such total field configurations, they repulsively interact with each other Right? And just because of repulsive interactions alone, when we have a limited area of the sample, you can see crystallization. Right? They form sort of two-dimensional Wigner crystals. Uh, and you can see in here, indeed, uh, hexagonal ordering appearing spontaneously due to those repulsive interactions. Uh, but um, we can also control uh, the nature of those interactions and in liquid crystal uh, of this type we can turn repulsive interactions to attractive interactions um, and uh, uh, see how those um, uh, hexagonal lattices with pretty large periodicity can become hexagonal lattices with much smaller periodicity just because we switched repulsive interactions to attractive interactions. And so in this particular case, we use a liquid crystal which has negative dielectric anisotropy, so that uh, if we apply voltage uh, beyond the threshold voltage needed to align with the crystal director, we go from vertical full and bound alignment to the alignment where we have some inkling component and twisting of the director field. Um, and this input component can be characterized by the so-called C-director field, which Robin discussed with you yesterday, essentially telling you about tilting of molecules, but here it's not in smectic C liquid crystal, it's pneumatic liquid crystal, but we still can describe the input tilting of um, liquid crystal director by vector field, telling us about directionality of tilting, and so, um, as we introduce this in-plane twisting and in-plane C-director field um, in some voltage range, as you can see here, <coughs> we uh, turn off, turn the repulsive initial interactions that we saw on the previous slide to attractive interactions so that uh, the hexagonal lattice periodicity shrinks and we now obtain a hexagonal uh, um, crystal lattice uh, islands, you know, in here with much smaller periodicity, as you can see. Um, and uh, uh, in between them, we can see uh, the twisted director field configuration, not homotropic anymore. Only in between the torrents, we have homotropic regions. So you can understand why this happens because. Um, and here, when we apply voltage, we have some in-plane twisting uh, of the director already. So the director is not only tilted, but it's also twisting across the cell thickness. And so uh, the homotropic regions uh, in applied electric field are shrinking in size, right? And so uh, the torrents attract each other and shrink in size a little bit. And so we therefore obtain those um, hexagonal lattices with much smaller periodicity. But as we increase voltage a little bit further, what we see is that uh, uh, the uh, torrents become accompanied by the umbilical defects on one side uh, of the torrent, and uh, uh, they essentially form the polar structures. 
um, such structures, the polar structures where we have total and blue billy, uh, then interact attractively and form chains along the C director uh, in the liquid crystal cell. Right, so uh, um, let me depict for you why we have those umbilics, right? Because if we have a liquid crystal cell, we understand that initially we have um, homeotropic alignment, right? Because of vertical boundary conditions at no apply field. But then as we apply um, field to a cell with um, um, negative dielectric anisotropy, we induce um, this in-plane component, but the tilting of director can be in different ways, right? So in here, as uh, the director tilted toward this size, I can uh, represent it with an arrow of C vector field pointing in this direction, but um, you can imagine that the other way of tilting could be also possible where you know, instead, director is tilting in the opposite direction, in which case I would represent it with an arrow point in this way, right? And so, now you could have a non-singular umbilical point defect in the C vector field uh, texture uh, in between them, right? Because uh, the director could also tilt this way and that way uh, before and about the board, right? So I would then have um, C vector field pointing, you know, two at the center and following such a defect in C director field. So this is what uh, those black points um, corresponds to, right? And so we have a total embedded in um, uh, such a liquid crystal cell along with an umbilical defect next to it, they together form a depolar structure and you can see they interact attractively um, and uh, eventually form those chains. So um, uh, this means that uh, by knowing topology of field configurations that we generate uh, and how they are embedded in a uniform director field, we can control by changing voltages in a very tiny voltage range the large number of um, self-assembled structures of topological defects. Right? So all we have here is um, the torrents um, which have point defects and uh, uh, those double twist toroid uh, as well as umbilical defects and they are self-assembling due to elastic interactions in between them and we can control this self-assembly by changing applied voltage in a very small range uh, between 0 and 5 volts as you can see from here. So I see that I am running out of time but next lecture I'll discuss with you crystals and fuzzy crystals of uh, such topological field configurations and so on, how we can use them to uh, generate optical vortices and what's common between some of them and um, the skirmions and many other interesting topological uh, field configurations and ferromagnets and other um, physical systems. Okay, thank you and uh, it's still answer. Well, um, I'm substituting for uh, Christian as the chairman for this morning. Are, are there any questions for uh, Ivan at this point, please? Um, when you do the 3D imaging of the toron, um, your imaging beam has huge electric fields. Does that not disrupt the toron itself? Um, it's a very good point. So, um, you remember that we use light to generate torons. But then we are also using lights to image the structure of those field configurations. And so it's all about playing with powers, right, because uh, uh, of laser beam. And remember that one of the reasons we use femtosecond laser sources is to be able to use very low average powers at which we pretty much do not perturb field configurations. 
but we are still able to image them. Other questions? Yeah. Well, I think we should uh, take a break at this point, and hopefully the nice ladies upstairs will have some tea for us. So we'll